So today I'm just going to provide a brief overview of the work we conducted as part of Survey 2 um, of the Hidden Crisis project looking at rural water supply functionality. Our aim in Survey 2 was to investigate the underlying reasons for functionality outcomes that we observed in Survey 1. And the, the key question uh, that we were asking in Survey 2 are what are the physical factors underlying hand pump functionality? So to answer this question, we conducted detailed forensic assessments on 150 hand pump boreholes, which were a subsample of 600 hand pump boreholes that we used in Survey 1. We systematically dismantled the hand pumps, and I should say that they were India Mark II and Afridev hand pumps. We conducted a pumping test to measure aquifer yield, took samples for water chemistry, conducted borehole CCTV su surveys to assess construction of the boreholes, and asked communities questions about the performance and reliability of the boreholes. And I'll refer back to this figure, which is the five functionality categories that we defined in Survey 1, from fully functional through partially functional, low yield and poor reliability, to non-functional and abandoned boreholes. And we had about 10 sites from each country within each of those categories. So the first thing we did was we deconstructed the hand pumps and uh, conducted... Um, observations and quantitative measurements of the of the component. So you can see some of the problems um, that we observed in, in this slide and we found a range, range of problems with components. Many components were corroded and damaged. Corrosion of rising main and rods was a particular problem and particularly weak points were the joints um, where threads were worn and corroded through as you can see in the center picture here. We also observed cracking of head flanges and rising mains, but that was less, less common a problem. And these are mainly from India Mark IIs, which use galvanized steel components. The Afridev um, used P PVC rising mains, and we found that in general they had less problems, but were commonly bent. So this slide just is a summary of um, the conditions that we found components in. So over 60% of rods were corroded, more than 40% of rising mains were corroded. Other types of damage were less common, although up to 50% of rising mains were damaged and about 30% of rods were damaged in other ways. And we define damage here to include bending, cracking or other general wear. Uganda was particularly a problem where 80% of rods were corroded and 60% were um, of rising mains were corroded. So this is really pointing to the need to maintain and replace rising main and rods in particular. As I said, Uganda was particularly a problem and we use pH as an indicator of the risk of corrosion. Um, so if we take 6.5 as the threshold, we found that in Uganda generally all of the waters had low pH and the risk of corrosion was increased and we could see that in our observations. So we also measured the thickness of the rising mains and the galvanizing on the India Mark IIs, but also the thickness of the rising mains on the Avridev. And we found that in greater than 50% of India Mark IIs, these components did not meet design standards. In the case of Avridev, about 30% of rising mains did not meet design standards. And this leaves a significant question mark over the quality of material used in the hand pumps um, in the three countries that we were working. Thus, Material quality and standards are potentially an important area for intervention and improvement of rural water supplies uh, using these hand pumps. And that's just to show um, the, the thresholds, um, the standards, and you can see the, the level at which um, the number of pumps are, don't meet those standards. We also examined the number of times other components such as cylinders and seals, etc., were mentioned as a problem in our breakdown history. And we gathered the breakdown history from relevant community members during the questionnaire phase of the survey. Other than rising mains and rods, seals and cylinders were the most common problems. And the images on the right just show some of the conditions that we found them in. 
Once the pump was deconstructed, we measured the static water level and conducted a pumping test to measure the aquifer yield. In this slide, the red line shows the maximum pumping depths from India Mark II and after death hand pumps. But we can also see in this slide that water level appears to be an important determinant of functionality outcome in Ethiopia. So we can see there is a trend in increasingly deep water levels as we move through the functionality categories. Functional boreholes have the shallowest water levels and the smallest range of values, while boreholes that are low yield and unreliable have the deepest water levels and the largest range of values. The relationship isn't quite as clear in Uganda and Malawi. Similarly, in this slide, the red line shows the minimum transmissivity value usually required to sustain a hand pump. And again, we can see that aquifer yield seems to have an important influence on functionality with the clearest relationship in Ethiopia and Malawi. So we can see similar patterns in the box plots here um, as we saw for water level. So we see there's a trend of increasingly small transmissivity as we move through the functionality categories. Functional boreholes have the highest transmissivity values while boreholes that are low yielding and unreliable have the, the lowest transmissivity values and the largest range of values. As we can see from the previous slide, Uganda had the lowest overall transmissivity values. So in addition to those pumping tests, we also analysed a large number of pumping tests um, that were constructed by drillers and, and others that commissioned boreholes. And we found that in Uganda, the mean transmissivity values were less than five metres squared per day. This was highly dependent on geology and it also varied significantly between districts. In Matania, for example, the vast majority of pumps have transmissivities below 1.5 metres squared, which is roughly the minimum transmissivity required to sustain a hand pump. The variation between different districts has significant implications for management of rural water supply in these districts, suggesting that other sources may be required or that strict arrangements may need to be put in place for communal water supply from these sources in order to ensure that communities are able to access an adequate quantity of water fairly. So our transmissivity results also have significant implications for future investments in rural water supply. Firstly, they suggest that a significant pro proportion of wells can barely sustain a hand pump. Secondly, our results suggest that roughly 75% of the wells in our study would be unable to sustain larger pumps required for large irrigation systems or piped water supplies. This is particularly the cases in those districts that we talked about in Uganda. So the red light here shows the minimum transmissivity usually required to sustain a hand pump. And the red line here shows the minimum transmissivity usually required to sustain a motorised pump that's required for a reticulated system such as an irrigation or a distributed domestic water supply system. And you can see that most of the transmissivity values are below that line. But in Uganda in particular, again, it would be very difficult um, to install these larger pumps uh, in boreholes. So the final part of our assessment was the borehole CCTV surveys, which we used to assess the construction of the boreholes. Borehole design is very important. And there's three images on the right hand side of this slide, which I'm going to show you um, just to illustrate the importance of pump position, screen length um, and screen position in, in the borehole design. So in these figures, the blue line is the water level, the red line is the pump position and the, the area with the crosses through it are either uncased sections or screen sections. And this is an example of a fully functional borehole. And what you can see um, in this one is it's well designed. The pump is placed uh, a good distance below the water level and there's a significant length of uncased section at the bottom of the borehole. In the next image, the borehole has a very deep water level and poor pump position. So the pump is just below 
the water level and the water level and the pump are well within the screen section and only the bottom of the borehole is actually um, below the water level. So this, this pump is always going to struggle to deliver um, sufficient water because the water level is too low and the pump is liable to come out of the, the water. And in the third example, again the pump is placed very deep, this time well below the water level, but the screen section in total is a very um, small part of the borehole um, and the pump is placed in the borehole, which is in general a poor, a poor design um, for the boreholes. The other image on the slide, um, the histogram of the pump depths, shows that um, in the three countries, about 13% of sites exceeded the maximum pumping depth of the hand pumps that we looked at. In Ethiopia, as we saw earlier, we have deep water levels and in 31% of sites, the pumps are placed deeper than the design depth of the boreholes. So deep water levels, as we know, is a particular problem in Ethiopia. And until recently, the AFRIDEV was the standard hand pump in Ethiopia. But as a result of having to drill these boreholes and encountering deeper water levels, um, increasingly the Deep Well India Mark II is being used. So this solves the problem of um, hand pumps having to access deep water levels. But at the same time, it's caused more problems with hand pump corrosion because the AFRIDEV, which is used in the shallower wells, um, uses PVC components and doesn't corrode, whereas the India Mark II, which uses the galvanised steel components, is more liable uh, to corrosion. So solving one problem in this case has created another. So in conclusion, the forensic techniques um, that we developed in Survey 2 helped us to diagnose a number of underlying issues such as deep ground waters, uh, corrosion of rising main and rods, substandard materials, poor construction, low transmissivity, particularly in the non-functional boreholes, and um, low pH, increasing the risk of corrosion, particularly in Uganda. But there's good news as well. And most notably, transmissivity at most sites is enough to sustain a hand pump, and in some sites is enough to be upgraded to a larger pump for irrigation or, or pipe water supply systems. But also our method helps identify these problems um, and this is the basis for mitigating these measures going forward. So some of the key areas for intervention include better operation and maintenance, better borehole siting and standards in construction and materials. Thank you for your time.